Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Bernard Prusak and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College. King's is a liberal arts college, relatively small, about 1800 students in northeastern Pennsylvania and we're sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross. This is our fifth Ethics Center event of the semester. And this is the second event in, in what I'm planning to be an annual post-election day series named uh, TBD. So if you have some ideas for names, please uh, send me an email. If you want to sponsor this series, send me an email about that too. It'd be all ears. Thanks for joining us. And thanks especially to our two uh, presenters who will be talking about a topic of crucial importance in U.S. politics today, democracy amid digital disinformation. Let me do a quick bios and then we'll get uh, right to work. David Karpf is an associate professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He writes about digital media and politics and his work has appeared in a wide range of academic, excuse me, sorry, academic uh, and journalistic publications including Wired, The Nation, Nonprofit Quarterly, and The Chronicle of Higher Education. He is also the author of two books published by Oxford University Press, The Move On Effect, The Unexpected Transformation of American Political Advocacy from 2012, and Analytic Activism, Digital Listening, and the New Political Strategy from 2016. Finally, he has a new Substack newsletter entitled The Future, Now and Then, to which you can subscribe. And I learned before we, we uh, got on camera about Dave's uh, Twitter fame, and I'm going to learn more about that uh, after this event. So maybe you too can, can Google Dave and Twitter and find out the scoop. Jennifer McClinton Temple is professor of English at King's College, and she'll serve as our respondent this evening. She holds a PhD from the University of Oklahoma and has taught writing and literature at King's for 20 years. Her teaching and research interests include ethics in professional writing, teaching composition, and Irish, excuse me, uh, yeah, composition, and Irish literature. Okay, let me do a quick nuts and bolts. So Professor Carf will speak for about 35 minutes or so, and he's got a PowerPoint for us. Professor McClinton Temple will give a five to seven minute response. Maybe they'll talk to one another a little bit. And then all of us will do Q&A until around 8.15. So 8.15 Eastern time will go 75 minutes. For the Q&A, please send questions through the chat. Uh, if you're new to Zoom, if we still have people in this world who are new to Zoom, the chat's there at the bottom of the page. Uh, you're only able to chat with the hosts. Please send questions to me, Bernard Prusak, since Jennifer and Dave will be, will be busy answering questions. Um, I'll do my best to introduce your questions into the mix. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted on both the McGowan Center's YouTube channel and Facebook page. And I'll also uh, send everybody who's registered a link tonight to the event. And I'll put it on Twitter too. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jennifer. Please take it away. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. Can everyone see my PowerPoint now? Bernard, is that right? Yes. Great, excellent. Um, so thanks for having me. I, there's a lot of ground that I wanna to cover today, basically five years worth of ground. Um, but in discussing doing this event, which we uh, we're talking about doing before the Facebook papers or the Facebook files dropped, uh, before Facebook changed their name to Meta, uh, I have plenty of things that I can tell you all about that. I could spend 35 minutes just explaining to you all why Meta is a really dumb name. Um, but what I really want to focus on, what I think it's important for us to put our attention to, uh, is that it's just over a year since the election, and there's an extraordinary amount of the country that is not convinced of its outcome. Because that, I think, is now the central focus of us as we think about democracy amid digital disinformation. Um, and in, in thinking about this talk, my thoughts actually went back to a talk that I gave in December of 2015. 
Uh, I attended a conference of political scientists who study elections. I was invited to give the keynote because I'm an internet guy and they wanted to some answers on whether we could blame the internet for this mess. Uh, now, again, this is December, 2015. This is before any vote, primary votes have been cast before the Iowa caucuses even. And so our conversation was really about just how weird the Republican primary was shaping up to be. Because at that time, it seemed to professional political scientists as though Donald Trump clearly wouldn't be winning the Republican primary, but that the primary up to that date was just behaving strangely, stranger than we had come to believe in the, in the past. We didn't expect it to be going the way it had been going. And so I took some time to lay out some ideas about how digital mobilization and digital politics were changing the way people engage online. And I, I come back to that theme now because I, I live in Washington, DC. I live just a, a few blocks actually from where the insurrection happened on January 6th. I had to keep my kids home from school that day and they couldn't go to the playground because we weren't sure if the playground would be safe because there was an, an insurrection. And it's still galling, still surprising to say that out loud, that there was an attack on this Capitol by the supporters of the outgoing regime. That's a thing that happens in countries, but not a thing that I had ever believed would happen in this country. And it's the puzzle that I think we face now is how did January 6 happen? And the slice of it that I want to discuss with you here is to what extent can we blame the internet for this mess? And what I'm broadly going to suggest to you is that while digital disinformation is part of the problem, it is more a member of the ensemble cast than it is the central actor that led to January 6 and has led to what is now referred to as the big lie, this, this belief that uh, the Democrats stole the election through uh, like secret files in the, in the election machine, machines. Um, that disinformation that's now been pulsating through the country for over a year, um, or just over a year, um, that digital disinformation, while the internet is a necessary component of it, we wouldn't have it without digital media, I think if we want to understand why it's happening, we need to look in a different direction. So before I get to that, what I also want to discuss with you is some pieces that I wrote in the aftermath of the 2016 election with regard to a company called Cambridge Analytica. Um, this is one of the difficulties of giving a speech to Zoom is usually I would be scanning the audience to see how many of you have a deep recollection of the Cambridge Analytica story and how many of you have no memory of it. If I was giving this talk two or three years ago, I think all of you would know Cambridge Analytica. Today, I'm guessing it's 60 or 70%. Um, but the Cambridge Analytica story emerged after the 2016 election as a way of explaining how Trump won. And in particular, as a, a, a black hat story explaining that the reason why Trump won was because of this consultancy to Cambridge Analytica that was worked with his data team and they believed uh, had somehow hacked Americans' mind and convinced people to vote for a candidate who they wouldn't otherwise have voted for. Uh, the scandal deepened, it was a major scandal for Facebook because it became clear that Cambridge Analytica did in fact have uh, a huge pile of Facebook data, both on people who had once downloaded a Cambridge an, an app by a, a professor who was working with Cambridge Analytica and by everyone who they were connected to and was connected to them. So they had a massive pile of data on most American voters. And that led to this set of stories about how they might be using that to digitally micro-target the public and convince people to cast ballots that they wouldn't otherwise convince. Um, I was an early skeptic of Cambridge Analytica, of the Cambridge Analytica story um, as an explanation of why Trump won. Um, that's now largely been borne out. While Facebook certainly didn't handle the issue well, uh, there's very little evidence that Cambridge Analytica actually did any of the things that they claimed they, they were able to do. Um, and that led me to write a piece that was published in 2019 uh, titled on, Dig on Digital Disinformation and Democratic Myths. And it's a, the thesis of that piece is something I wanna discuss with you for a few minutes. The thesis is that the real threat of digital disinformation to American politics does not come through its direct impact on political knowledge, on what the electorate knows about politics 
or on how we believe in, behave in elections, but instead that it is an indirect impact on our political elites. So let me tell you a bit about what I mean by that. Um, the direct effects of misinformation, at least in elections, I would argue are extremely rare. And the reason for that is systematic. The reason for that is because whatever your age, you have that many years of exposure to the Democratic and Republican parties in this country. When you encounter a piece of digital disinformation online, a rumor about the Democrats or a rumor about the Republicans, true or false, that is then added upon the pile of impressions that you have built up of those two parties over the course of your lifetime. And within political science, we have decades of research on just how difficult it is to persuade people to cast a ballot for a candidate that they would not otherwise vote for. Uh, the current thinking within the field is that the persuasive effects of the multi-billion dollar political persuasion industry in elections is so small that it's basically, it, it basically does not exist. There are some mobilization effects, there are some effects in primaries, but in terms of the effect, the persuasive effect in general elections, what we find is that all of the TV ads, all, all of the online ads, all of the mailings that you get has virtually no impact on how people vote. And that's because of how hardwired we are in our thinking about the Democrats and the Republicans. Because again, we have built up our impressions of them over the decades and the decades. When I wrote this piece in 2019, COVID wasn't on the radar yet. We, we, we didn't have the term COVID yet. But what I would have said to people then is that the place that we most need to worry about disinformation and misinformation would be an area of mass public importance and virtually zero public knowledge. And then COVID happened. And I, I think COVID has kind of proven the point there that if you take yourself back to December, 2019, you would probably never heard the word COVID before. You had some impressions of pandemics from pandemics in decades past possibly, but the idea that it could happen here was the stuff of uh, pandemic fiction. And once the pandemic starts, since we have zero information, you and I, since we've never heard of this disease before, we don't know how it travels, we don't know how it operates, that means that online disinformation in that area can be tremendously impactful because we don't have any impressions about masks, we don't know if they work, we don't know if they're dangerous. And if we hear the wrong things, then we start from a baseline of incorrect beliefs. So in an area like COVID misinformation, I think there's reason to really worry about digital disinformation and its impact on public health. But within electoral politics, I think we're all the way on the other side of, uh, of this spectrum here. Vote choice is probably the single hardest thing to move. And the idea that online disinformation or Facebook ads is determining who votes in which elections, there's just very limited evidence for that. In the context of January 6th in the 2020 election, what I wanna to suggest to you then is that while misinformation plays a part in people showing up to the Capitol and becoming so outraged that they then march on the Capitol and people die and they you know, break in, that anyone who showed up there began as a willing audience that it was already their impressions of the Democratic and Republican parties, their trust in the political system, that when they, get, when, when they hear that information, they don't dismiss it, but they decide to act on it. They decide to act on it because they trust the people who are speaking it and because maybe they hear, hear it in so many different places. So clearly it has some effect since they did turn out. But blaming Facebook, I think, is the wrong choice there because it actually puts too much emphasis, too much impact on the misinformation instead of the people who are spreading. So that takes me then to the second part of the argument that I made in 2019 about the indirect effects of digital misinformation. Um, again, the, the piece is called on digital disinformation and democratic myths. And what I wanna to suggest to you all is that it, it cannot be the case that the problem with American politics today is that the mass public 
doesn't know enough about American politics, doesn't have enough information or doesn't have the right information, that we're failing at the mass level against some civic ideal of how much we should know and how engaged we should be in politics. The reason that can't be the central problem is that if we look through American history, there has actually never been a time where the American public lived up to our civic ideals. If you go back to the founding, the people who were turning out to vote in the founding were actually often being invited out to stand in person with their candidate and when they were, and then were offered whiskey, it was a party afterwards. If you look at the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which is a celebrated moment of civic engagement, the audience of those debates were so large that when we recall the lack of electric amplification, we have to conclude that most of that audience could not hear the two candidates as they debated. And certainly historians would point out that most of them were there at a, a civic celebration, not entirely paying attention to what the two candidates were saying. It was covered by the media, but we've actually never had a time in American history where the public lived up to our civic ideals. But throughout American history, we have managed to have at least a partially functioning democracy. And that seems clearly to be under threat now. So what I suggest in the piece is that what we have had is not an attentive mass public, but we have had a load-bearing myth, the myth of the attentive public. We have had through the decades public officials, officials, elected officials, political elites, who behaved as though the mass public was watching, and if they stepped out of line, they could be held to account. During the golden era of broadcast media, that was mostly enshrined in actors like Walter Cron Cronkite. So there was this sense that if a politician was caught in, the, in a lie, the media would hold that politician to account. Viewers would see that and would act on that information. That was rarely tested. And it's unlikely that viewers, given how little information they were actually consuming in those decades, it's a half hour of television per night, of, of news per night. It's unlikely that actually they would always be holding their politicians to account. But what we had then were politicians who believed it was the case and that belief affected their behavior. American politics, in fact, all societies are built both on laws and on norms. Laws are enforced because when you break them, you, can, you go to court, you pay a fine, you go to jail. Norms are softer stuff. They are collective senses of how we should behave. And the way we enforce norms is when someone breaks them, they receive public shaming or they receive some other non-legal force. If a politician 30 years ago broke, uh, broke against norms, their expectation was that they would be shamed. They would be drummed out of polite society. Not that they would have broken a law, but they would have done something that is viewed as bad and unfortunate they would be held to account. And that belief then affects their behavior. So what I believe has largely been happening for at least the past five years, probably more like 10 or 15 years, with digital disinformation online, is that elected officials, political elites, have been, been able to more and more effectively see that the myth of the attentive public is not true. They've been able to see that if they blatantly lie, the people who like those lies clap and even donate. The people who dislike them might howl online, but most of them are not paying attention. And they can see that, they can measure that, and that affects and degrades the norms that hold up elite politics. That I think is the main cause of degradation of American politics today. It is the degree to which our elected officials, our political elites, are able to see that they can in fact get away with anything because very few people are watching unless they are devout fans or devout opponents. And those publics are so small that you can get away with so much. If that continues, then we cease to have a functioning democracy, whether or not the mass, of public, mass public is well aware. Now, there's two more points that I want to make. As I said, I wanted to cover a lot of ground in this talk. So the, there's another case of digital disinformation that I often keep in mind. Um, a few years ago, actually in, in 2018, I did a project where I 
read the entirety of Wired magazine from 1993 through 2018 chronologically. And what I was looking for was a sense of how the digital future has changed and remained the same as it has arrived. Wired magazine started uh, before actually we even had a World Wide Web. And throughout its history, there was this sense of how is society changing? How is technology changing society? So I wanted to look for repeat patterns. And one of the things that I found that I, I just found gleefully entertaining was this piece from uh, January 1997 titled News You Can Abuse. It begins TWA flight 800 shot down by friendly fire, Bill Clinton's cocaine habit. The net is doing more for paranoia and conspiracy than anything since J. Edgar Hoover's infamous FBI files. This is a story after the 1996 presidential election about all of the conspiracy theories that could be found online about candidate Clinton. And I, I find it remarkable, of course, because in 2016, we also have all these conspiracy theories online, well reported in Wired Magazine, in fact, about all the conspiracy theories shared and spread online about candidate Clinton. In 1996, it doesn't amount to anything. In 2016, it leads to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. It, we could say, well, that's because the first Clinton, Bill Clinton won, and the second Clinton, Hillary Clinton lost. But that's, I think, a little too jaundiced of a view, because what it really points to is the ways that the digital media environment has changed over these decades. So in particular, I think when we compare to the internet of 1996 to the internet of 2016 or 2021, what has clearly changed is its scale, its speed, and the financial incentives. By scale, I mean, it's uh, only a portion of the American public is still is online in 1996. Everybody's getting on the World Wide Web then. They're, they're logging onto America Online. But we're still in the, the tens of millions. The, the population is still just getting online through dial-up access. And the internet back then, the World Wide Web back then, was still pre-Google, where it was difficult to find anything that you searched for. So online rumors spread through chain emails. They spread, spread through discussion boards if you were on AOL.com in a discussion space. But they spread slowly, and they mostly spread only if you were looking for them. So they were akin to tabloid magazines that you could pick up in, a, in the grocery store and, and would you know, tell you all sorts of things about celebrities that were clearly untrue, but nobody was checking and there was no harm. So that scale changes as everyone gets online. The speed and the transmissibility changes as big tech arrives, both Google and in particular Facebook, where people are connected to their entire social graph. And these companies are algorithmically identifying what sorts of content keep people on the site for the longest amount of time. This has come up recently in the Facebook files, if anybody's been reading the Wall Street Journal and the other stories about uh, this topic area, that Facebook for, for years now has been paying close attention, not just to what gets spread online, but also what keeps its users on its website the longest. And what they've found is that content that makes people angry tends to keep people on Facebook for a long time. Content that keeps, makes people happy, they, they share it, but they don't stick around as long. And so they have algorithmically weighted towards anchor. That has then helped the spread of conspiracy in a way that the old web of the 90s never did. It's not that we didn't have algorithms back then, we did. But as the scale has grown and the speed has grown, the degree to which we are algorithmically monitoring things and incentivizing some content versus others has also massively grown. That third point, I think, is one that I want us to dwell on, which is the financial incentives. Online conspiracies in 1996 was for hobbyists. You did not get rich off of Bill Clinton conspiracies on the internet. In 2016, you can. There's a well-reported a well-reported well story in Wired actually just after the 2016 election about the Macedonian click farms, teenagers in Macedonia who had figured out that if they created fake newspaper websites and had stories about uh, the Pope endorsing Trump, which he had not done, those kinds of, those kinds of stories, if they bought cheap Facebook ads, would lead to lots of clicks, lots of views, and overall tens of thousands of dollars in online advertising revenue. 
Online conspiracy by 2016 had become a business. It continues to be a business today. I don't really want to talk a lot about the QAnon conspiracy theory today. It's not my primary area of expertise. But I think it's noteworthy that QAnon and that one of the people involved in it, the QAnon shaman, was one of the people who was arrested on January 6th. He was the guy with the horns at the Capitol. QAnon books have been some of the most, the best selling books on Amazon. The QAnon conspiracy theory has made people wealthy. That's different from a marketplace of speech in which we need to keep all speech free. It's a marketplace that is incentivizing lies and is creating a, a game in which in order to win, in order to get ahead, you have to recognize what the different big tech platforms are uh, algorithmically waiting for, and then find a way to feed those algorithms, find a way to give it to them. Part of what has made American democracy so dangerous today is that at the elite level, the level of media elites, what, what they have been learning is what algorithmically sells and they're giving people more of what they demand. And then the big tech companies themselves are also supercharging that, they're too, turbocharging it. So that it's not just that everyone's able to speak online, but people are figuring out how to become rich through online lies, online misinformation and disinformation. But I still wanna come back to this point that I, I think blaming Mark Zuckerberg for January 6th and the big lie is too easy. This is something that I'm starting to see emerge just now with the publication of the Facebook papers. Because we now have stories from inside Facebook, from these documents inside Facebook, that Facebook engineers were watching the January, the big lie and watching Stop the Steal and January 6th building up on the site. And they themselves felt that they were the site was not doing enough to stop it. Clearly, Facebook was used for some of the mobilization that led to the insurrection. So we can't let Facebook off the hook entirely. I don't want to suggest to you we should do that. But I worry a little that we are arriving at a consensus similar to the brief consensus around Cambridge Analytica, that we should just blame Facebook, blame big tech for all of our troubles. And while I think we should direct some of the blame to them, because they did far too little to algorithmically quash the big lie, Mark Zuckerberg wasn't the person who was promoting. And this brings me back to the role of political elites. So this is a, a picture of uh, professor, a law professor John Eastman and Rudy Giuliani at the January 6th rally. This is John Eastman giving his speech just after Giuliani had riled up the crowd telling them that we should have trial by combat in his argument for why they needed to stop the certification of the electoral count. John Eastman then stood up in front of the crowd, crowd and told them that, they, that he had proof, that they had proof, that the voting machines had secret files that were awarding uh, states like Georgia to the Democrats, to, to Biden, and that the only reason Biden had won is because the entire thing had been stolen. And he insisted that uh, Mike Pence could stop the, stop, like, stop the certification of the election, and that states could then sort it out and award the election to Donald Trump. And he told that crowd that it was bigger than Trump because if they didn't stop this certification, then we wouldn't have an American democracy anymore. Eastman, not long after this, was uh, forced to retire by his university, Chapman University. Um, but he's been in the news quite a bit recently. In fact, I, I believe just today it was announced that he's been subpoenaed to talk to the January 6th uh, um, uh, investigation in Congress. But he's recently been in the news uh, because you, you may have heard that he's the person who wrote a memo for Donald Trump to uh, Vice President Mike Pence, articulating an, an what he called wargaming a set of options for how they could stop the electoral count, subvert it, and award it to Donald Trump. His recommendations would have amounted to the overturning of electoral democracy in America. His fundamental theory was that since the vice president is the person who formally counts the votes on January 6th, that the vice president is, few, uh, is free to decide which votes count. And if the vice, sitting vice president can do that, especially given that sitting vice presidents are often running for president, 
that would then mean that our votes on election day carry only a suggestive weight since the political elites can just do whatever they want to do. This was a bold and I think ridiculous suggestion. And I raise it because to me, it comes back to the question of norms. How do we as a society police the norms and protect the norms that suggest that people like John Eastman, political elites like John Eastman, shouldn't get up on that stage and lie? Because let's be clear, if he was telling the truth, if it was in fact the case that the, ballot, the, the voting machines had been rigged, and that's the only reason Democrats had won, then the behaviors he was arguing for would have been appropriate. If the election had fundamentally actually been stolen, then people would have been right to be outraged in that manner. The problem was that it was a lie, and he knew it was a lie. People like Eastman know better, but profit from the lies. I raise this to almost briefly brag about what I think is a partial solution. So when the stories came out in the New York Times and the Washington Post that Eastman had published this memo, this was because uh, Woodward and Costa, two journalists, have a book coming out and they, they got the memo. And when they, sh they showed the memo, Eastman said, no, that was a draft memo. And he provided the longer memo, which was even worse. Um, it was then pointed out online that John Eastman was scheduled to give two lecture or uh, talk on two panels at the American Political Science Association annual meeting. And people made jokes on Twitter, like we always do, about how, you know, hey, this is a, a great opportunity. Political scientists never get to interview the people who are trying to overthrow throw democracy, and he'll be right there. I didn't think it was a joking matter. I'm, uh, my degree is in political science. Uh, I'm a practicing political scientist, uh, and I've been a leader in the American Political Science Association. I've, I've headed a section before. And one thing that I knew about this was that the American, American Political Science Association didn't invite John Eastman. One of its sections or related groups do. It was a group called the Claremont Institute, of which he is a board member and a, a sitting director of their constitutional program. Um, They've been defending Eastman ever since then uh, and talking and, and pushing the stop the steal language, uh, suggesting that we need to imagine a post-democratic future for America uh, or a post-democracy future for America. Claremont Institute is a related group of the American Political Science Association. They had 10 panels and they had invited him to be on two of them, where political science as a field would be legitimizing his views. So I wrote an open letter signed by 280 of my fellow political scientists, calling on our association to end John Eastman's membership in the organization and break off all of its ties with the Claremont Institute. After I did this, we were greeted perhaps unsurprisingly to howls that we were engaging in cancel culture, that we were trying to cancel Eastman and the Claremont Institute for their conservative views. I would suggest to you that that's patently uh, ridiculous, that they still have all of their rights to speech. We just also have the right not to associate ourselves with that speech. But I would also suggest to you that if we are going to demand more of our political elites in the absence of the myth of the attentive public, it has to be through engagement of this sort. Now I can brag that after we published this open letter, the American Political Science Association reached out to Claremont Institute and said, since there are so many APSA members who are upset about this, this isn't a direct quote, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but since there are so many APSA members who are upset about this, we wanna move your in-person panels to online so that we don't have people showing up and yelling in the midst of uh, our, our first conference post-pandemic or post-COVID pandemic. The Claremont Institute then said, well, if we can't have our panels in person, we're just gonna cancel all the panels, how dare you? And APSA said, that's fine. So Claremont canceled their panels. John Eastman did not speak at APSA. I've uh, submitted a, a request to, the, to APSA's membership committee to consider terminating John Eastman's membership. We'll see how that works out. I've also made a request along with my 280 uh, co-signers of this letter that they sever their ties with the Claremont Institute. Because while they used to be an organization that primarily engaged in conservative political philosophy, they now are mostly engaging in political mobilization that is trying to hasten the 
decline of American electoral democracy. And I think APSA should stand for American electoral democracy. But the reason I raise this is it points for me to a better way out than just calling for better public knowledge about how the internet works or calling to hold big tech accountable. Though, again, we should do that too. I think if we American democracy is going to recover from this fragile moment that it is in, it is going to be, going to be because we demand more of our political elites and our media elites, that we hold them to the norms that they used to hold themselves to, and that we create a cost for the violation of those norms. I don't think that John Eastman should be kicked out of the American Political Science Association because he's a conservative. I think he should be kicked out of the American Political Science Association because he stood up at a political rally and lied to people. And those lies were dangerous enough that they then sacked the Capitol. I think he should be kicked out of the American Political Science Association because he authored a memo as part of Donald Trump's team that if they had taken its recommendations seriously, would have effectively ended American electoral democracy. And I think all of us who care enough about these topics to show up to a webinar on the topic on a Monday night probably agree that American electoral democracy is a good thing worthy of defense. If we are going to defend it, then we have to make these sorts of demands. And calling it cancel culture is too easy of a way out. So to summarize, because again, I'm trying to draw together a number of disparate threads, sort of what I've been up to in this field for the past five years. I think it is easy to over to, to overclaim the persuasive impacts of digital misinformation. It is context dependent, it is frequently overstated. It can be used as a mobilization tool. Clearly, digital misinformation about the, uh, about the so-called stolen election leads to people's anger as they turn out on January 6th. And the people who pushed that misinformation should be held to account. But it's, it's too easy to say, oh, well, people don't know what they're reading online and that means that they're misinformed and we can't have a democracy unless people are well-informed because we've never had a well-informed public and we've never really had pro the problems that we're having right now. Misinformation is most effective in the areas where the audience has scant existing knowledge. That's places like public health and COVID. It's not places like who votes or how does voting work. And I think the solutions to this need to be focused on elites. We need to treat misinformation not as a mass problem, but as an elite problem. I often hear calls for media literacy or digital media literacy as a solution to our misinformation woes. And I wanna to suggest to you that media literacy is a leaky bucket that can never be filled. If we believe that the only way to sustain American democracy is to have an American public that is deeply media literate and digitally media literate, then we're holding ourselves to an expectation that we've in fact as a country never lived up to. I would say that it's time to regulate big tech. That one of the things that we've learned through the Facebook files and through the past five years is that companies like Facebook are simply too big. They are granted too much responsibility or too much power to handle responsibly. Congress is looking at those regulations. I fully support it. I think we also clearly need greater, in, uh, greater independent research on big tech. One of the things that we're learning through the Facebook files right now, if you've been following the story, is that Facebook knows so much of what Facebook is doing. And the only researchers who have access to that data are researchers working with or for Facebook, held under non-disclosure agreements, unable to share what they're learning unless there's a major leak like we're seeing now. So these big tech firms need more scrutiny, they need more regulation, but that also cannot be enough. If, we take, if our takeaway from January 6 is, well, if we just broke, broke up Facebook, we would be fine. I think that is letting the most important actors here off the hook. And that is that for American to democ democracy to survive, we are going to need to find ways to enforce norms among our political elites. We have to create a cost for the people who are getting rich and powerful off of conspiracy theory and mis misinformation. People like John Eastman, people like Rudy Giuliani, 
Because if we do not do that, then even if we regulate big tech, what we're going to see is that now that they realize that the myth of the attentive public does not constrain their actions, we're going to see a race to the bottom amongst our political elites. And without a functioning political elite, our democratic institutions cannot sustain themselves. That was a lot. It was also a bit of a downer. I'm also always a bit of a downer in my talks, ask any of my students. Um, so let me stop there. I'd, I'd love to hear what uh, folks have to say. Hi. Uh, you, can you hear me? Dave, you're the only one that will be able to tell me if you can hear me. Um, thank you very much for, for your talk, Dave. It is such an important um, topic. It is, as you say, it's a bit of a, of a downer, but it's um, something that we fret about a great deal, especially in the academy, right? Um, that the disinformation is proliferating and uh, it is important that we try to develop strategies to combat it. Um, I want to talk about it a little bit from a slightly different perspective. I'm an English professor, not a political scientist. Um, so it, it, it seems to me, I teach students how to write. And in doing that, I, I teach them how to do research. I try my best to teach them how to do that. And it seems to me that people are becoming uh, at once more credulous and more skeptical, which seems, that seems like those things would um, oppose one another but uh, that people are becoming more credulous uh, toward ideas and images that feed their own bias and fears and insecurities and more skeptical of ideas and images that seek to counter those narratives. Uh, in short, people are deeply affected by confirmation bias. If they already believe the thing, that's going to affect how far they go. But at the same time, people are claiming that everything is up for debate. You know, it's just a matter of opinion. Um, people will say, I research everything. People are admonished to do your own research, do your own research. But what does that mean? What does it mean when people say, do your own research these days? Many, many different types of activities uh, from experiments in a lab to crunching data, to interpreting poetry, to conducting drug trials, all of those things are research. All those things are uh, come under the heading of research. Uh, what they all have in common is that they are systematic and they evaluate their sources for credibility and validity. But I don't think that's what people mean these days when they say, do your own research. I would ask everybody to think about uh, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers, uh, his recent admission that he was lying about having received the COVID-19 vaccine. Of course, he says he wasn't really lying, that he said something like, I was immunized, um, and he was using that term loosely or whatever. But his subsequent argument is that he has given the NFL 500 pages of research uh, on vaccines and mask wearing. Research that he says calls both of these practices into question. But what Rogers is actually talking about is uh, a combination of conspiracy theory, misunderstanding, and outright falsehoods. That, that's not research. Uh, I would also ask people to remember the, the great time this summer when actor Woody Harrelson posted a report touting the conspiracy theory linking 5G networks uh, with coronavirus and other health uh, problems. Woody Harrelson has 2 million followers on Instagram. When he posted that, he said he had not fully vetted the article, but he found it interesting. But one wonders what Harrelson meant by not fully vetting a theory for which there is no evidence whatsoever. Did, did he? partially vet it. Uh, like research for Rogers, I think vetting for Harrelson might be a synonym for, for reading. Uh, many today seem to think that simply running across or uh, at best reading a theory or story qualifies as research. Uh, and as you say, one of the things that's changed on the internet is the scale, the amount of information that is available. Information both good and bad. Um, but when I think about how I had to do research when I was in college, which was 30 years ago, 
um, it was much more difficult for me to put my hands on things that weren't true because they had to go through such a, a difficult and careful editing process to become books, to become articles. It's so easy to put things online. And so that, that the scale is just much greater. Um, but the problem is not Aaron Rodgers and Woody Harrelson. The problem is the platforms that uh, promote them. Instagram, in the case of Woody Harrelson, which is owned by Facebook. Um, and in the case of Aaron Rodgers, appearing on Joe Rogan's podcast, which is hosted by YouTube, which is owned by Google. Um, <laughs> so you start to see how um, these media conglomerates are huge and affect our the dissemination of our inform of information to us in ways that are um, increasingly scary. Um, but as you say, we've never been that great at research, right? We've never been that, uh, that well-informed um, a public. I would also argue though that we, yeah, we may have always been inattentive, um, but the internet and social media make all of these things easier to do, to deceive, to confuse, to distract. Um, think about how much harder and more deliberate one had to be to fool a would-be benefactor into thinking you were someone you were not back in the days before the internet. I, I'm old enough to have received an email trying to get me to transfer money to someone in Nigeria claiming that the funds were already owed to them and I would be helping them out of a jam. This scam is not new. The, the scam that it's a cousin of, the Spanish prisoner, that goes back to the 18th century. But what is new is how easy it is to construct these false narratives and to disseminate them to huge groups of people relatively easy, easily. Um, think also about how social media and readily available, available tools therein make it possible for regular people, not celebrities, not politicians, not elites, to curate their own existence, to make themselves look different than they really look and to, to make their lives look different than they really are. It's, it's easy for people to do now. And I think it's all part of the same um, big ball of wax. I, I just want to end uh, my response uh, to underscore Dave's point that the crisis that we face is not an entirely new one. I want to quote from The Second Coming, a poem by William, William Butler Yeats. Yeats writes, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So Yeats wrote that poem in 1919 in the wake of the First World War and during an extremely violent period in his native country of Ireland. And also, by the way, during a pandemic, 1919, still part of the pandemic in the early part of the 20th century. Um, to apply those lines to today's crisis, it seems that some of us are working very hard to spread disinformation and lies. Those are the worst, full of passionate intensity. And the rest of us, the best, the leaders of elite establishments and institutions aren't doing enough to combat it. And earlier in that poem, Yates says, um, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. For us to save the center this time around, uh, we have to make sure that we're diagnosing the problem correctly. Uh, the, the crux of the problem is not our family and friends and neighbors who believe things that aren't true, but rather the elite institutions from media conglomerates to state governments to the United States Congress where you can easily hear a sitting congressperson tell lies on the floor of the house, easily. Um, we allow them to continue to d disseminate these falsehoods and refuse to hold them accountable. They refuse to hold themselves accountable. So we have to do it ourselves by not voting for them, by calling them out when and where we can, and by not um, buying their products in the case of uh, Facebook and other media conglomerates. Um, so uh, I just wanted to kind of look at it from a slightly different perspective, uh, especially in ways that we can see direct effects, like you say, with uh, COVID misinformation. Thanks. Dave, did you want to 
say yeah, a little bit. We have a so this is largely a, a yes and that I think with the Aaron Rodgers case, what stands out to me is there's both pressure that Canon should be applied to Facebook. I think they've done they they could have done a better job on COVID, but actually in many ways I think they've done a, a decent job at least. But what stands out to me is that if you want to solve a problem like Aaron Rodgers and uh, COVID disinformation, probably the best way I think to approach it is by focusing on the elites who are getting rich off of those lies. So one guy that stands out to me, uh, there's a guy named Alex Berenson, uh, who has been described in, in news articles as the, the wrongest man on the internet, I think is the description somebody gave in a title. Um, he was briefly a journalist for the New York Times. After that, he became a, a, a novelist. And he decided very early in the pandemic that he was a expert on, on COVID. Um, and he has been throughout the past year and a half constantly seeding and telling these stories about how all of the science is wrong. He and he alone knows, knows the truth and he's spreading it. Uh, and he has gotten wealthy over this. He has just recently been uh, kicked off of Twitter, but for the, for the longest time, he was finding a platform on Twitter. He was finding a platform on uh, pod, uh, in podcasting. He was finding all of these platforms that not only allowed him to speak, but gave him these massive financial rewards. And when other people look at, at Alex Berenson and notice, wow, this is the way to get rich right now. The, you know, this is the new scam. That then amplifies the problem. If you disempower the Alex Berensons of the world early, if you take away the financial incentives, then you start to solve the problem. I mean, I, I mentioned the uh, Macedonian teens in 2016. The way that got cleaned up, I mean, that really got cleaned up, is they were producing these uh, fake newspapers. And Google just before the election and Facebook just after the election demonetized fake newspapers. They, they set a new rule saying, if you're producing a website that looks like a newspaper and is not a newspaper, you can't collect ad revenues. And once they set that rule, once the platform set that rule, that problem gets solved. It doesn't solve all of the misinformation, but we can handle this on the supply side. And when we do, that's often when, again, people talk about cancel culture or free speech. And I'm a big proponent of free speech, but I also think that we need to enforce our norms and recognize when it's not free speech, it's paid speech. Thanks to you both. Uh, we have a, a number of questions since uh, for all our listeners. You'll hear some of your questions and others will be mashed together. Um, a, a lot of the questions, Dave, have to do with uh, what you've just been talking about. They're more or less under the, the category, what is to be done. Um, so I'll, I'll you know, try to pose the questions in some uh, logical order. Uh, so here's one. Once this uh, myth of the attentive public, the load-bearing myth of the attentive public has been punctured, uh, can it be restored? Uh, do we need new myths? Are myths what we need? If so, you know, what myths would they be? So again, there are other questions about what can be done, but this is a question that has to do with, with myths in particular, whether that, that myth can be restored once it's punctured, whether we need new myths, so on and so forth. So the honest answer is that I don't know. Um, I think it has to be restored for American democracy to function. Um, I think there was a time in which, I haven't, I haven't complained a lot about Congress today. I taught class this morning. I complained about Congress in my class. Um, Kidding, mostly. Um, there was a time in which Congress abused the filibuster less than it did right now, out of a sense that if they are constantly filibustering everything, that the public would hold them to account. And they've learned over the past decade or so that actually the, the public won't. And now we have the filibuster abused for everything. Now, one solution is to get rid of it. That is, I think, probably where we're trending, I think, sometime in the next 10 years some congressional majority will probably just get rid of it. But that, that to me stands as evidence that we need political elites that behave as though there is an attentive public, whether there is or not. Now, how do we restore it once it's punctured? Again, I, 
I think what we need to do is promote real lead, like better leaders amongst our political elites, like support people who genuinely believe in American democracy and hold for, hold firm to its norms, try to reward them on both sides of the aisle. Um, and my, my political stances, I, I think, are easily guessable by everyone, but I, I respect what Liz Cheney has been doing, despite disagreeing with her on pretty much every policy, because we need political leaders who stand behind some bedrock procedural principles. And I think that we can have leaders who believe that they have a covenant with the American people and that there are certain norms that they need to abide by, whether or not they'll be rewarded for breaking them. Those people are out there, but they, they need to be promoted. And the people who stand against that need to be shamed and need to feel shame when they do. Um, that said, that's a hard road. There, there's, if there was an easy solution to doing that, I think we would have stumbled upon it already. So it, it is going to be hard work. And I think we've learned over the past several years that American democracy is fragile. So I, I'm not sure that we get there, but I am confident that for American democracy to return to at least semi, semi-functional state, we need to reinforce that norm and prop that myth back up. We can believe in it. Uh, there, there's the myth- mythologies inform our behaviors. And so we can recast ourselves in that belief, even if we recognize that you can violate it without con- consequences, because we decide that it is not a thing that one does. Good, thanks. Um, there are a number of, of questions that circle around your observation that the public needs to hold politicians accountable to norms to which they used to hold themselves accountable. That was one way uh, you formulated your claim. A lot of those questions just have to do with how. But let me um, pose uh, one of those questions now. So uh, given the truth of an inattentive public, uh, which you underlined and Jennifer as well, is, is the implication more or less that only political elites have the platform and power to hold fellow elites to the public norms that hold up our democracy. So you referred a a moment ago to to Liz Cheney. Mm -hmm. You you might extend this question. Uh, Is it in particular members of the Republican Party that have the most power to hold the so-called big lie Republicans to such norms? so, you know, I, it's a question that really begins with, well, okay, let, let's let's acknowledge the point that, that you know, we don't have an attentive public, we don't have a well-educated public. So who's mm-hmm. going to uh, do this holding to account? Is it only the elites who can hold elites to account? So th- there's two layers to the answer there. Um, the first layer, and this is, if those, some of you may follow me on Twitter, you probably hear me say this at least once a month. Um, I think it is clearly the case that only the Republican Party can fix the Republican Party. American democracy as it is currently structured is a two-party system and you need two, both parties to be basically supportive of electoral democracy and norms of governance. Um, that is currently a fight within the Republican Party. The Democratic Party isn't going to decide that fight. It's going to get decided within the Republican Party. So on that level, yes, it's elites. Um, the second level to it, though, is the myth of the attentive public is a myth about the mass public being attentive. And one thing that we should know, I, I briefly mentioned that the internet is and misinformation has a mobilization impact. Um, I think it's worth noting that while the mass public is not attentive, there are segments of the public who are deeply attentive and in fact, more attentive than they've ever been before. Like we are living through the era of small donor fundraising because we've realized that actually there's the subset of American, um, of the American public who do pay attention to politics pays a lot of attention and is willing to pony up 10 or $15 for their candidates. So the status of a political elite in the digital era uh, is more is, is more fuzzy and porous than it was 30, 40 years ago. It used to be very easy to identify a media elite 
it was somebody who appeared on TV or was bylined in a major paper. Today, uh, identify, I did a, an academic article back in, I think it was 2013 with the co-author, where we were trying to identify who were media elites and who were not. And the only thing we could come up with, because the boundaries were so porous, is we decided, well, if they have a Wikipedia page, we're going to call them an elite. If they don't, then they're not an elite. Because, you know, what do you say about a, you know, a political blogger who's just on a website, but has, you know, 30,000 followers? Like, is that, is that a media elite? I, we, it's very hard to tell. So that porousness, both for media elites and political elites, means that the subset of the public that is engaged is more engaged than ever before. Now, I'm still a little worried there because it's not clear that our political elites respond very much. I mean, they respond to incentives, but you know, when Ted Cruz decided to fly to Cancun in the midst of a crisis in Texas, a lot of people made Ted Cruz jokes. I made a couple of Ted Cruz jokes. Ted Cruz didn't care. So that sense of, you know, I, I don't think that's a thing that a political elite would have done 20 or 30 years ago, just abandoning his constituents. Even if he wasn't doing anything, he would have sensed that I'm supposed to be here because that's what we're supposed to do. I'm supposed to try to find a way to help. And if not, I would have expected them to be shamed and them to feel shame. And we seem to have a shamelessness amongst our elites, which makes them often unresponsive. But I would say it's, it's not just elected Republicans who can fix the Republican Party, but People on the left probably aren't going to fix the Republican Party. It's probably going to be attentive Republicans who decide to demand more of their party. Um, I, I want to keep asking some of those questions about how we hold politicians to account, but there's another one that fits now. Uh, so I'm, I'm recalling Ted Cruz eventually did come back, right? Yeah. Um, and he had some, you know, half-baked story for blamed his wife i think yeah his kids kids Uh, kids and wife Uh, but there's there's some swirling here about the connection between uh you know donald trump and and this moment Mm -hmm. um because you know trump does seem to be a politician who um or a public figure uh who um well, can be shameless, right? Who has been proven very difficult to shame. So I'm, 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 you know, the questions aren't all that precise, but can you speak to uh, you know, that connection between Trump and this moment? Because there, again, even Cruz came back, right? Even Cruz you know, ate, ate a bit of crow um, eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas a figure like Trump does not. And that's part, it seems, of his, his power as well. Yeah, it, Trump, I think, has been a massive accelerant. The, the dissolution of these governing norms, I think, dates back to roughly 1994 and Newt Gingrich and the, and, uh, the new Republican majority there, which I, I've noted in one paper is also just after the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Essentially, I think our elites were probably behaving well back when there was some uh, bipolar enemy that all the, the entire country had to be united against. And that meant that they would fight at the edges, but then knock it off and govern because there was a sense of, well, you know, it's America versus someone. And it's just after we end this era of uh, the Cold War, but also United States versus USSR, that we start having elites that are elected elites that are testing the boundaries and finding that, you know, you can violate these norms and really nothing goes wrong, or right? they, they shut down the government and it turns out, you know, like didn't go great for them, but the sky didn't fall. Um, so that's a, it's a process that I think starts back then. Um, and Trump's role in it is, again, if I'm right that norms only function until they're violated and nothing bad happens, like a thing that Trump supporters have loved about him is the way he's willing to like bust down every door and break every norm. Um, you know, he, he's telling his truth at all times. Um, and the thing that uh, cultural critics like me, I mean, there's plenty of things that we didn't like, but one of the things that we didn't like is that that constant wrecking of norms with no demonstrable impact or with no demonstrable response endangers this myth of the attentive public. And we could point to things throughout the, throughout the Trump years, you know, the Trump years were not great for elected Republicans. Like, in 2017, 
political scientists like myself were sure that Democrats wouldn't be able to retake the House because the partisan skew of the House was just too big. And then they took the House and they kept on winning special elections. So there's plenty of circumstantial evidence that Trump's cracking of norms, you know, Trump's nearly getting into nuclear wars on Twitter wasn't something that was well loved, that the Republican Party would have been better off if he would have just been a little quieter on Twitter, a little more respectful of norms. I think they would have been happier with a Trump who uh, like didn't pick fights with John McCain after he died. But also every one of those norms that he crashed through, since the next day he's unapologetically still president, that just keeps on providing a narrative that none of this stuff matters. You can do anything and be rewarded for it. And in fact, what Trump is rewarding you for is allegiance to Trump. And we're seeing this now where uh, every, pretty much every Republican Secretary of State who certified the election results when Donald Trump wanted them to find a way to dispute them is about to face a primary challenger from a dyed-in-the-wool Trumpist who decides Republican Secretaries of State should only certify election results when Republicans win. If they win, that's deeply dangerous for American democracy. And that's set up because of the incentives that he is creating and the example he's providing. So in that sense, he's a unique danger, but he's a unique danger because he's an accelerant of patterns that have been moving forward through society for 25, 30 years. Let me follow up. And, and Jennifer, uh, you should feel free here to uh, interject. So, um, Someone that's observed, I think, keenly, most, if not all, of the scrutiny tonight has been directed toward the Republican Party. The scrutiny has been coupled with the phrase elected political elites. Uh, you know, is the suggestion that this is only a Republican Party problem, or or would you, um, you know, suggest that, that we see this, this problem playing out in the Democratic Party as well? Um, I think the evidence is that it has been deeply asymmetric. It's not that the Democrats are pure or perfect, but the challenging and dissolution of these norms by elites has been predominantly and, and empirically quite clearly on the Republican side. There, there is no Democratic equivalent of QAnon. There's no Democratic equivalent of Donald Trump. And there's no Democratic equivalent of John Eastman either. So in that sense, while I think the, the issues apply to both parties, like we need better political be elites who behave as though there's a covenant between them and the mass public. While we need that on both sides, the damage that has been done has been asymmetric and it's concentrated within one party right now. Let me uh, pivot to a question then that has to do with uh, cancel culture. So, um, and, and Jennifer, you might want to, uh, speak here since uh, you, you raised the question, Jennifer, of how we call people out, right? And Dave, you gave the example of, of uh, uh, you know, trying to, I'm not, I'll use the term ostracize, right? But because that's the term that comes to mind. Uh, John Easton from, from the professional society. So is there something to say in favor of cancel culture uh, or is it, is it dangerous? Uh, does it, um, you know, and, and that might not be the term we want for it in any event, and these are loaded terms, but, um, you know, is, is cancel culture itself somehow of this moment? Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's not, um, you know, crashing through norms the same way that a Donald Trump has, um, but you know, does cancel culture somehow belong to the same um, you know, trend that you've noted uh, since the end of the Cold War? That's sure. what I can do with that question. Um, so I don't think cancel culture is particularly of this moment because I think cancel culture is essentially the same as the political correctness, uh, moral panic that we had in the 1990s, but with the addition of social media. Um, so I, I don't believe it's a unique threat that we're facing now. I also, if I were to rank order the threats to American democracy or civil society right now, I don't think it would make the top 20. Um, the thing that I think is usually missing from the cancel culture discourse 
is a sense of power. Um, the people who have the most to fear from cancellation tend to be the people with the least power. Uh, and the cases that we tend to fret over the most tend to be those of the powerful. Um, and I like I, I certainly think that there are reasons to sit back and think about when are the appropriate cases, what are the appropriate cases for public pressure and ostracization? Like, when is it right to pursue that? And when is it going to uh, inappropriately silence speech? I think that's a good intellectual conversation to have, but I think we should always keep in mind that there have always been norms that have policed our speech. Like, if you were an opinion columnist 50 years ago, you may not have worried about saying the wrong thing and losing your column because the public was outraged. But you were certainly aware that you can't say things that your editors uh, or their biggest supporters and advertisers uh, find uh, like, like most, most appreciate and enjoy. We've always had in mind some set of audiences and focused our speech to make sure that we are talking to them and not offending their sensibilities. And I think what we're seeing in this moment is with social media that more people are finding and using a platform to try to police and enforce those norms. And that can be particularly scary for people who look like me, um, who generally have felt comfortable and know, known what the boundaries were for what they could say. Now are asking ourselves, wait, I'm not entirely sure what I can and can't say. That seems, ner that, that's nerve wracking and that can also quiet me in a way that I don't want to be quieted. So I think that's, to me, that's the nature of the conversation we've been having about cancel culture, but it's a very uneven conversation. And largely what I would say is, okay, these boundaries are changing in a messy way. For those who have power with great power comes great responsibility. I'm a Spider-Man fan, I gotta say. Uh, and so I think it, you know, if you are somebody with a platform, then the recognition that with that platform, you now need to bend your speech, not just to your editors, but also to audiences who are going to speak back. That's an uncomfortable process, but I think it's a very natural and normal process. And I think that we should also worry about how those same trends can get weaponized and exploited against people who lack power, because those are the people with the greatest threat. I just want to I just want to address two points there. One, it, cancel culture, yeah, the phrases of the moment, but I would also, maybe the uh, idea of publicly shaming, and by the way, there's a great book called So You've Been Publicly Shamed by Jonathan Ronson. I Such teach a it great book. It, it, it talks Sorry. about lots of different um, instances of this public shaming. The internet, what we were talking about before, the speed and the scale, there's, it, that is different from what we saw pre-internet, that Twitter mobs, they work fast and they work um, in huge numbers. Um, and so I think that that is a phenomenon that is of the moment. The other thing I, I would say though about cancel culture is there is a huge difference between saying the wrong thing and having your speech be censored or even having the um, impression that your speech is being censored and lying, knowingly lying, a la Rudy Giuliani. Those two things are not the same. And I, I think that we're at this moment where we equate so many things that are not the same. And it leads us to, the, the the question that from the audience about is this just a Republican thing? Um, I agree with Dave that while it's the principles don't simply apply to one political, the, the principles apply to both political parties, but this is, um, there is a, a, an asymmetry uh, in, in what we are currently seeing. Um, it, we see a lot of people trying to equate things that have no business being equated. Like I, I think of Donald Trump saying, there are good people on both sides in Charlottesville. I think of that 
public school official in Texas saying, if you have one book about the Holocaust, you need to have an opposing, what is an opposing view of the Holocaust? That doesn't even make sense. Um, and, and we're in this place where we're always trying to equate things and say, oh, it's on both sides. It's happening on both sides. And um, these things don't have to be like the other. So I'm not sure cancel culture is the same. I'm not sure that's what Dave's talking about. No, and, and I didn't mean to suggest through the question that it was. Um, I, I think, though, you can see at, at least one point of connection. I mean, again, it has to do with norms on both sides. So on the one hand, Dave, you're talking about the crashing through of norms, the dissolution of norms. Uh, on the other hand, we're talking about changing norms. And as you put it, you don't, you're don't, you not sure always where the boundaries are, right? And so the, the two phenomena do seem to be connected. They're not the same, obviously. But there does seem to be some some underlying connection to the two, um, and that's you know, potentially interesting. Now we've got like thirty seven more questions. One person really wanted to hear what you had to say about Meta and why it's a stupid idea. It's eight seventeen. He asked for the three minute version. I don't think he. I know the person who asked that question. So you, I'll, I'll connect him too, and you can you can tell him. Uh, let me just tell people I have a piece in the latest Wired magazine uh, about why VR is the, I think I called it um, the rich white kid of the tech industry uh, ecosystem. It just keeps on being rewarded more chances based on its potential, despite constantly failing upward. Um, I wrote that before they said that they were going to call themselves meta and be a metaverse company. But um, I have some good snarky responses in that. Just read that piece. I'm very proud of it. There's your answer. All right. One last question, even though there, again, there are a number of really good ones and we're already a touch over time, but um, uh, one, one of our listeners observes that the cigarette industry was finally held to account for targeting audiences with misinformation. Is, is part of the answer, not full, but part of the answer to uh, the problem that you've been discussing, to hold tech companies to account for algorithms that are sending people down rabbit holes? Um, yes, but in a way that is deeply complicated. So really what we're asking there is how do we regulate big tech? And the solution that's often proposed is uh, big tech currently operates under what's called Section 230, the Communications Decency Act. Um, that is a shield that says they will not be held responsible for the speech on, on their platforms. Um, we can tinker at the edges of 230, but I, I am not of the opinion that we need to completely overhaul it and hold them responsible for the speech on their platforms. That would be a radical change to the internet, not necessarily a good one. But there are a lot of other, I'd say regulatory attack surfaces for how we deal with big tech, um, including limiting their ability to gather data. I think it's fine for, let's take Amazon as a company or Netflix. I think it's fine for Netflix and Amazon to gather data on my use of Netflix or Amazon and use that to improve their services to me. But they should not be allowed to turn that into a data profile of me that they then sell uh, to third party vendors that go to fourth and fifth and sixth parties. We have a completely unregulated data industry. If we were to shut that down to say that your data profiles cannot be recombined and sold like that, it would radically change the finances of the internet. And I think largely for the better. So that wouldn't be penalizing, directly penalizing companies like Facebook for sending us down rabbit holes, but it would be changing the incentive structures that lead them to try to have their algorithms be immune from public scrutiny and keeping us on there at all time, because the more time we spend there, the larger their data profiles and the more they can sell them. If we limited their ability to do that, I think that would be a big first step towards limiting harms. Thank you very much. I think we should end. Thanks to you both. That was really interesting. Uh, a lot more to think about. I've scribbled a lot of notes. Thanks to everybody for joining us and for sticking with us to the very end. Apologies if, if I didn't um, ask your question. There's some other good ones here that I'm going to have to leave by the side. Maybe I'll send some along to you, Dave. Sure. So thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.